Today's video gets a little dark, so be warned. But by exploring this darkness, we are going to illuminate something truly amazing about the nature of human minds. Part 1. Darkness, my old friend. God, your bloody skin looks awful. You've got spots all over your forehead. I'm not sure this lighting is right for your face, it makes you look really shiny. Are you standing too far to the left? What is up with the haircut, mate? Did you, did you remember to shave this morning? You look, your beard looks all scraggly. God, you look like an arsehole. You look like a fat, stupid arsehole up there. It just looks fake. You're never that smiley in real life. People can tell. Oh my God, is that your voice? Your, your voice sounds terrible on camera, mate. Why do you sound posher on camera than you do in your actual voice? Oh God, maybe that is your actual voice. Why is your skin so red? Is it the li lighting? Is that your you face? You look like you're made of pork. You look like the inside of a pork pie. Who did the color grading on this? It looks terrible. Why did you wear that shirt? God, you look fat. Just get rid of it. Get rid of the whole thing. Burn the whole thing down. Are you down. doing a weird thing with your mouth? Why did you just look over there? Why do you bloody bother? There's no point. You're just gonna disappoint people. You should just shut the whole channel down. You don't deserve it, frankly. You don't deserve this platform at oh, all. You look sweaty. You look like a, like a fat, sweaty arsehole. You should nail your front door shut and wait till you bloody die, you fat, stupid, self-righteous knob. Part 2. The Split Self. That's just a little extract from my internal monologue. And you might have a similar voice in your head sometimes that tells you all kinds of lies about being worthless or how you'll never be or do what you really want or this is a popular one. Other people don't really like you. They just pretend to. Yeah, I get that one too. Sometimes this can verge into actual mental illness, but the vast majority of people have an experience something like this. Not a literal voice, but a feeling of should, a feeling of shouldn't, a feeling of monitoring and critiquing their own behaviour, as it were, from the outside. I call my internal voice Mr. Not Good Enough, because that's all he ever tells me. And he's a very skilled actor, Mr. Not Good Enough. Sometimes he appears in disguise as the voice of reason or the voice of common sense. And it's only when I stop and think about it that I realise all he's really ever telling me is, you're not good enough. The philosopher Simon Critchley says that this little voice is essential to having a human mind. He thinks that the self is split into two parts, the part we experience and then that little voice who plays many roles. Sometimes it's our moral conscience, sometimes it's the nagging voice or the abusive voice that tells us we shouldn't do that, or that because we've done or not done something, we're worthless. If we obey it, it's the little voice that says, be proud, you did a good thing. Critchley calls it our ideal self, the place where our ideals come from, the self we think we should be. And he thinks that little voice will never fully go away. He doesn't mean that we can never be happy or satisfied. We can learn to have a better relationship with our ideal selves, just that its demands can never be 100% met because those demands are part of having a mind. Like, we can't walk through walls, but that's not so much an impediment as it is just a feature of buildings. The walls are there to hold the ceiling up. The subject, the self, is a split subject, divided between itself and a demand that it cannot meet, a demand that makes it the subject that it is, but which it cannot fulfill. And on the one hand, that really sucks. Because sometimes my ideal self is really, really mean to me, and it's hard to get him to shut up. We'll be seeing later on how some ideal selves can get really nasty. But on the other hand, this might be the solution to an absolutely age-old problem in philosophy. Why should we care about morality? People have been wondering about this for as long as there's been people, and Critchley says, we can put our sceptical hats on all day and ask, why should we be nice to each other if it's of no benefit to me? But at the end of the day, we're gonna go, oh, it's raining, I should have brought my umbrella with me today. And there it is. There's the feeling of should. There's the ideal self critiquing the experienced self. And once you understand that, Critchley says, not only do you understand the foundation of the human mind, you understand the foundation of ethics as well. In her book, Perfect Me, philosophy professor Heather Widows sums it up quite nicely. Perfection is always beyond and out of reach, and that is crucial to the functioning of ethical ideals. By the way, if you can get your head around this split mind theory where we give ourselves certain rules and standards and hold ourselves to them, then you're well on your way to understanding Immanuel Kant, who's one of the most famously difficult philosophers ever, so keep up the good work. Part 3. When good selves go bad. I'm curious about where this little voice comes from. 
Where does the ideal self get its ideals? Critchley pays attention to it mainly insofar as it plays the role of a moral conscience, but it might be interesting to explore what happens when our ideal selves tell us things that are bad or untrue. That's why I opened this video with a little extract of my ideal self, Mr. Not Good Enough, not playing the role of a moral conscience, which he is perfectly capable of doing, but in fact being highly critical and unkind. You might have noticed that he's fond of calling me fat. It's because you are. In fact, he does that quite a lot. Body image is something I struggle with a little bit. It was actually difficult for me to go from my old format of videos where you can only see about this much of me to this. Because now that you can see more of my body, I know that when I edit this thing together, this asshole's gonna be leaning over my shoulder and telling me that I look fat. About two years ago, I was a little bit overweight. Um, I was quite unhappy with it. So in a dangerously short amount of time, I lost about a third of my body weight. I basically didn't eat and I exercised way too much and I went down to absolutely rail thin. Like I was unhealthy, dangerously skinny. And only about nine months ago, I started going to the gym to put on muscle and now I look like this. But the thing is, I think back to when I was happiest with my body shape and I have to confess, it was when I was unhealthy that Mr. Not Good Enough was finally telling me that I was good enough. And it's a weird feeling to realize that my ideals can be bad. That it's not just self-hatred, but self-approval that can be corrupted in that way. There we see an example of how the ideal self isn't always concerned with what's good for us, and can in fact be turned against the experienced self in the service of someone else, like a diet pill company. I mean, that's how advertising works, right? It gives your ideal self an ideal like wellness or coolness or thinness, and your ideal self feeds it back to you and says you need to buy that product in order to achieve the ideal. But the ideal self can be turned against the experienced self in even darker ways too. American thinker W.E.B. Du Bois chronicled a particularly disturbing example of this colonization of the mind in his book The Souls of Black Folk. Du Bois argued that African Americans had to, as an unfortunate means of survival, incorporate into their ideal selves the perspectives of racist white people who hated them, and develop what he called a double consciousness. To survive in a racist world, they needed to understand how their perfectly innocent actions might be perceived by racists as dangerous, and therefore get them in trouble. Innocent actions like playing with a water pistol, or sitting in Starbucks waiting for a friend. And Du Bois writes that this feeling of always having to be thinking of oneself from the point of view of somebody who hates you is a uniquely distressing experience. It is a peculiar sensation, this double consciousness, this sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in amused contempt and pity. One never feels his tuneness, an American, a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two warring ideals in one dark body, whose dogged strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder. What Du Bois is describing there, we today might call internalized oppression. The little voice of the ideal self in marginalized people being colonized by privileged people's negative opinions of them as a result of systemic material discrimination. And unfortunately, internalized racism isn't the only kind. There's internalized sexism, internalized transphobia, homophobia, biphobia, ableism. Our ideal selves are made up of thousands of little voices that we've been listening to all our lives, not all of them kind. So, if your ideal self is being particularly cruel to you today, maybe somebody else has been feeding it the script. In this way, internalized oppression goes beyond ordinary self-hatred or self-criticism, which are things that we can work on as individuals, and ventures into the territory of a systemic problem that will require all of us working together to materially change the world in order to address. Part 4. Quieting the Ideal Self When I was younger, I really wanted to see great white sharks in the wild, because I, I just think they're beautiful animals, still do. And uh, I, I spent all my savings flying 12,000 miles to Australia to go cage diving. And uh, yeah, it was a long, long journey. It was like five hours out on the boat into the Southern Ocean, 
and it was really rough and I was seasick and the captain was seasick and everyone was seasick and we spent all day out there going up and down on under this blistering Australian sun and we saw absolutely nothing and on the way back I was sitting on the boat and I was just thinking I, I've blown it I've come all this way and I've seen nothing I come so close to what I wanted to do and I, and I failed and as I was thinking this, the sun was going down over the Southern Ocean. And the, the, the cool thing about the Southern Ocean is that there's no landmass in it. It just goes all the way around the bottom of the world forever, right? And as the sun was going down, it, it hit the water in, in just the right way that it turned the whole ocean this just incredible orange, rusty gold color. It was, it was like an ocean of autumn it was like the waves were on fire and I was so so happy I had a beer I had my tunes I had an infinite ocean to gaze at and I thought even though I've come all this way and I'm leaving empty-handed it's all been worth it the little voice for just like 20 minutes was gone and I was just lost in beauty and I think as an artist that's one of the reasons people look at art it's one of the reasons I look at art anyway like for, for me that's what beauty is for it's something that happens to the experienced self that pulls me into the present and just focuses me on that experience whether it's a sunset or, or a painting or a piece of music or gazing into the eyes of somebody I adore or a piece of theater it just shuts the ideal self up for a second. <laughs> I know some people describe the feeling of meditation in similar terms, and I've tried it, and yeah, I can kind of see where they're coming from, although I know that's not for everybody. And to be clear here, I'm talking about a, a temporary quieting of the ideal self. We'll talk next time on the show about what happens if we just get rid of it completely, which can actually happen if you mess with people in the right way and it gets really nasty. But for most of us, we'll probably never get rid of the negative aspects of our ideal selves. We'll always have a, a Mr. Not Good Enough or a, a, a Yakov Goliadkin Jr. Or, <laughs> or a Tiffany Tumbles just breathing down our necks. But there's a flip side to it. Because although we can never reach our ideal selves, I find at least that there can be great pleasure in the pursuit. We can never win the game, but we can win the hand day to day. I'll, I'll never have my ideal body or my ideal personality, but I can enjoy striving for it. And actually, uh, when I became a professional actor, I had to change my name because there's a rule in my country that no two actors can have the same name. And I chose the name Oliver Josephine Jacob Thorne. And I took those names from some of the very finest people I've ever known people whose qualities I wanted to be closer to. That, I felt, was the name of the, of the ideal actor, the ideal man that I wanted to be. And there's something so beautiful and, and empowering about naming oneself according to the ideal. It, it's autonomy, literally. Auto, nomos, self and name. And, and it's so brilliant to the point where now when people ask me okay what's your real name I tell them Oliver Josephine Jacob Thorne and my friends call me Ollie <laughs>
Though I can deceive him, you know I won't leave him me. And when I get tempted or I and start to stray, my I shadow. your guidance just every day. Not a soul can bust this team in two. We stick together like glue. Me. And now to repeat what I said and the smile They'll need a large crowbar to break us apart Every mind is me and you And though all my whispers can bring me such pain They're only a feature of having a brain you can't have the sunshine and not have the rain Life is better when I is weak For my shadow and me Me, me, me Although your singing still needs work <laughs>